welcome to navigate a webinar series that we started a little while back during all of this craziness. Welcome, thank you for being here. This is part three, uh, managing through the COVID coup. We really like the COVID coup phrase for two reasons. It's kind of a play on words. Uh, coup obviously as a takeover, COVID has definitely taken over all across our country and around the globe and uh, put us all in a situation where we have to figure things out and also coop. We've been cooped up. Um, we've all been cooped up in different ways in our houses. Uh, some people now being able to get back out and do certain things. Maybe some people are getting to the office, but uh, nevertheless, it is uh, a, a double play on words that we like. Uh, I hope you all are managing well, and I want to touch on uh, our invitation real quick. You see that we have our masks on, our panelists all trying to be safe and and this is about helping all of our uh, folks in our network. And you may see that my mask is on sideways. And that was an intentional uh, move that we did from the beginning because it showed that we were definitely in uneasy times, different times, um, things that we were all sort of uncertain of. And uh, we maybe played a little fun with it as well. So the good news is we are trying to straighten these out. We are in a very good path and I feel very excited about uh, where we are as a community here and around the country. And we are making some progress in regards to the COVID and it's nice to see some things getting back to uh, at least somewhat on track. So very excited and anxious for you guys to hear from our panelists today, our speakers. We've got a lot of horsepower. Uh, Matt Galnor from the Chambers here, Mike Hicks from Beeson 4 and Gwen Griggs from Advos Legal. Uh, very excited to hear what they have to say for you guys. We've listened to our customers and we've been listening to our customers' customers. And that's how we've chosen and selected who's gonna appear in these webinars. So today we're gonna to hear from those folks. And uh, before we get started, just a quick little thought that I've had as of late. Uh, we've gotten through a lot in our country before. We've gotten through wars, depressions, terrorism, market crashes, you name it and uh, we are coming through a very difficult time now and we're still faced with many challenges. So what I do know is that we always rise up and get through it. We evolve and sometimes we're forced to evolve and this is one of those times where we're forced to evolve. I am hearing from our customers and our customers' customers and I know the folks on our panel are hearing that people are reinventing themselves, they're figuring things out, they're, they're, they're more focused. Uh, this is a time for us, as I mentioned in the last webinar, to be thankful and thoughtful, stay positive, figure things out. It's beginning to work. So I just I want to make sure that you kind of go into your day thinking along those lines. It's a big help than feeling like we're not going to be able to make it or we're defeated or what do we do next. Reach out to the folks that are around you. Some folks may be in a better spot to speak on this type of stuff than others. Don't be afraid to um, make it part of your regime as you move forward. So I'll stop with my little speech on that. Uh, we're going to touch on our agenda today. So let me first welcome Matt Galnor from Jack's Chamber, another member of the Jack's Chamber who's joined our webinar series. Matt is in charge of uh, public affairs essentially. He's the chief public affairs officer there and today he's going to be talking about legislative areas and public affairs for the chamber and what they do. Matt, thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Jim. I appreciate it. Then we're going to move on to Mike Hicks. He's the executive VP with Beeson 4, a marketing agency here in town. He's going to be talking about marketing, sales, customers, pivoting, uh, some really, really interesting stuff. Mike, thanks so much for being here. Happy to be here, Jim. Thanks. And uh, last but not least, as my father would say, the rose among the thorns here, uh, Gwen Griggs from Advos Legal is joining us and she's going to be uh, helping us through strategy and some of the legal stuff that you need to be aware of that you potentially aren't thinking about. Maybe some things you are thinking about. Gwen, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Look forward to the panel today. So a couple of quick ground rules. Uh, we talk about this being interactive and we mean it. So uh, we got a lot of horsepower here and part of our goal is to bring you very relevant, valuable information in a concise way that you can digest it quickly. As we know, you all have busy schedules, busy days, a ton of stuff right in front of you. And in doing so, 
We're also going to provide uh, a Q&A session at the end of this. So you have access to our speaker panel. You can ask any question you like, anything about your own business, et cetera. Um, fire those in. There is a uh, button in the bottom of your Zoom there where there's a Q&A portal. You just click on that. You could dump it right in there. Uh, we're also going to be sending out interactive poll questions. And these poll questions will be coming through as each speaker does their part. Uh, just click on those and respond. We're going to do a quick warm up one right here. How many wins will our beloved Jaguars have this season? Well, that's a hot topic around here and uh, it'll be great to get back to football and sports back in our lives for those of you that like sports. But uh, take a peek there real quick, answer the question. It should go away right after you submit it. And then we'll share the results with you. Let's see how you guys feel about our Jags. Okay, well, there's at least a few people that are dreamers like me that think we could win 10 games this year. That's good to see. But this is how the Q&A will work. Hopefully the Jags put something together for all of us. Uh, once you see those pop up, they're real quick and we'll kind of prep you for it. Then you hit the answer and then it'll get right out of your way and we'll get back to the uh, presentation piece. We're not gonna be using the chat feature or the raise your hand feature. So really Q&A, submit them through the portal, watch for your poll questions. And uh, I think that's all on ground rules. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Matt with uh, the Jacks Chamber. Matt is involved on a daily basis in all kinds of stuff. Uh, a lot of different meetings, managing up from a legislative standpoint, talking with a lot of the public and private companies that are in our area, but also working with the development piece and companies that would like to come to our area, which obviously is a big deal when you're talking about trying to grow a city. Uh, he's got an ear to the ground for us, and I'm super excited to have him here. Matt, take it away. You are driving the ship. Great. Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate it. Um, Again, thanks for the opportunity to be here and to, to kind of share kind of what we're seeing and sort of what we're advocating for for the for the business community. Um, let's see if I can get this. To... All right, there we go. Um, just a, a quick introduction: the, the chamber is the business membership organization with about three thousand members here in, in Northeast Florida. And what we do, especially on the policy and communication side, is we advocate for business-friendly policies and projects that drive quality economic growth in the region. So what we're really, you know, once everything started to happen with COVID-19, we had to really shift everything that we were doing. You know, obviously we're an organization that has, you know, it's kind of built on getting large groups of people in a room and and networking and talking about stuff. And so what we've had to do is shift that, but our priorities have, have really remained the same. Um, and it's, it's really been as important as ever for us to, to work with a local state and federal partners to really try and do um, what we can on the advocacy side to get the economy back up and running. So really there's a, our advocacy agenda that we had for this year has three main topics. Um, innovation, uh, which we've done a lot with the Bay Street Innovation Corridor. Uh, we've helped kind of push some of that. And then with some FinTech Academies that, that um, the governor announced uh, earlier this year, talent development and attraction, that's always going to be something that's very relevant for the chamber um, and, and for our community, because the number one reason that companies choose to move somewhere is because they have the quality employees that they need to be successful. You know, that's that's going to be their their top decision making piece every single time. And then downtown development is also something that, that we've that we've focused a lot on. Um, at the state and, and federal level, which it's interesting, last week, so we normally we take a trip to, to Tallahassee every year and we take a trip to, to DC to kind of meet with our elected officials and have business leaders that do that. Uh, but last week we would have been in DC. Um, and so obviously we did not go. We've kind of focused a lot on, on other issues, um, but we're still continuing to have the discussion of the business community uh, on different policy issues. For example, uh, we had our, at our board meeting last week, the, or I'm sorry, last month, the board um, unanimously supported, or voted to support the Duval County uh, half cent sales tax referendum that'll be on the ballot in the fall. 
Um, that's a plan for 1.9 million or nine, excuse me, 1.9 billion dollars worth of renovations and updates, and in some cases, new schools to really help, um, you know, fix the aging di schools that we have in our district, replace them, and add some new technologies. So we'll go to the first poll here. Poll is, do you support the Duval County Public Schools proposed referendum to use a half cent sales tax increase that we just talked about here? And while those poll results are coming in, um, one of the reasons, so, well, that's good to know. Um, I know that it's been having um, a lot of success in the UNF poll earlier this year, and it seems like there is a lot of community-wide support. And, and I wanted to share real quick why that's important to the Chamber. And one, two main reasons. One, obviously, like we talked about with talent development and, and attraction, we need quality public schools, and it's a quality of public education is always a priority of the Chamber. Um, the second part of it, it kind of relates to what we're going through now, is this is you know, nearly $2 billion worth of capital projects that will help get people back to work. And they will help, you know, get projects rolling and, and get people that may have lost jobs through, through other areas, um, an opportunity for something in construction. And also we know the construction jobs bring a lot of other jobs along with them as they're going along. So it's really a win-win for the entire community. And that's kind of why we are so supportive of it. Um, and as we look to kind of stimulate the economy, that's kind of what one of the things we're looking at is, okay, as a business community, how do we get more projects on the street quicker? How do we make sure that all of our small businesses are involved as much as we can? And then are there opportunities that if there's construction underway to kind of make some other improvements that will really benefit our community? One of those that we've, we've talked, we've heard a lot about, and historically this has happened with Jay, with the city of Jacksonville and JEA and some other entities, when they're um, when the roads dug up, they're looking at putting in fiber and things like that. And we're also looking with other partners on you know 5G and other connectivity improvements that we could make because we know that there were issues, obviously, when schools went virtual, and so everyone was having having to connect into the classroom. There were different, you know complications and challenges with that and some of them were just not having the connectivity to be able to get in to you know to access the classroom so here's our, our into our next poll um and i'll talk a little bit about the kind of what's currently going underway with uh jax usa partnership which is the economic development arm of the chamber we're continuing to meet with companies that are continuing to look at you know, making investment decisions and expansion decisions. So this is how many new jobs are being created. Okay, and it looks like the overwhelming response was between 500 and 750, which would be a great month. And I'll tell you, they had an even better month. The answer is more than hundred more than a thousand it's 1,155 so these are four projects that have that they have not been um, announced yet but they've been approved by the city council we are working uh, with the company and there's state approvals that need to be had to but we, you'll probably see public announcements on the names of these companies over the next couple of months and if you look there the industries that were that these companies are in advanced manufacturing information technology transportation, logistics, and financial services. Those are four of the five that, um, that we target here um, for our community. The other is health and life sciences. And a company you won't see on the list here is Forcura, which was recently announced um, a couple of weeks ago that they're adding 115 jobs in the healthcare information technology here, uh, building a new corporate headquarters. And that was approved by the city council um, earlier this year, and we just announced that. So, as you know, as we've been working remotely, and as companies have been working remotely, there is still a lot of activity, a lot of companies that are interested in coming to Jacksonville, 
I know our project managers and economic development team are, you know, haven't skipped a beat. They're having virtual site visits. They're having all kinds of things to, to help, you know, raise the profile of Jacksonville and then continuing to talk to companies that are looking to invest money here and create jobs here. So I just want to kind of leave it on that. Like there are, this is, we are seeing things continue to happen here, continue uh, economic, economic development. And, and we think that we're going to continue to see that. Obviously there's been some, you know, some hiccups along, along the way, but I, I think that, you know, it's encouraging news from on the economic development side that we're, we're continuing to, to rock and roll. So um, Jim, I will kick it back over to you. Thank you, Matt. Great stuff. Uh, love to hear what's going on. Love seeing the development that's happening. Uh, it's nice to know that we are definitely a destination. I know that uh, hearing that there's folks wanting to come here and they're actually uh, do looking uh, virtually is really something because, you know, obviously the lack of travel that's going on just shows the, the high level of interest, which I think is good for all of us. So uh, thanks again, Matt. Um, Next up is Mike Hicks from Beeson 4. Mike uh, has a great perspective uh, in general before COVID hit around helping folks uh, with their businesses, all things marketing. Uh, and I'll let him take you guys through a journey today that's gonna include some, uh, some cool anecdotal stuff that he's seeing real time. Uh, super talented guy and I'm really excited to have him on here. Mike, take it away. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity of uh, helping you guys out and maybe sharing a little bit of a different perspective uh, than we normally do. Um, like Jim mentioned, you know, we, we've been working with small business owners and large corporations trying to counsel um, from a few different seats. Um, for our larger corporations, we act as a chief marketing officer, uh, sort of help guide and steer that ship for what they're trying to do. Uh, and then for small business owners, we're essentially kind of their marketing department. So we're dealing with all types of people all across the nation and specifically right here in Jacksonville. Um, so I thought, I thought it'd be interesting to share a couple of things. Uh, and more importantly, what, what we're talking about, right? So if you think about perhaps the last four months, um, first of all, congratulations to all of you for making it through it. Uh, and second of all, let's start pivoting. Um, a lot of what Matt was saying is encouraging to hear from a legislative and, and government standpoint because it sounds like things aren't happening. Uh, and that's, that's kind of exactly what, what we're seeing from our side. So if you look back um, in the beginning in March, um, all of our conversations were about what is going on. I don't understand. Is this real? Does this affect me locally, nationally? And what does this mean for my business? Uh, in April, it was kind of this defensive, let's, let's save the clients. Let's see how we can continue to still get a few more new ones. Um, May last month, it was adoption month. This is the new reality, it is happening. And so what can we do to adjust for this? And right now what we're doing with the majority of our clients here in June is we're executing on the new plan. Um, this is kind of the new thing. And so I've got this poll question up. I want you guys to take a look at it because I'm interested in your feedback. So individually, where does your organization stand? Um, are you currently still lost and, and a little bit consumed in the fog? Are you in crisis management mode? Um, putting together new adjustments or have you guys already done that? So we'll go ahead and do that quick poll question now. Okay, good. So looks like everybody already has figured out what happened. Uh, everybody has fixed all of their terrible negative stuff. Um, but it looks like right now a lot of people are over half are doing new strategies. Um, and just under that are doing uh, their new plan. So, so that's actually really good to hear. Um, what I would share with you is everybody's probably in the same position that you are. So here's, here's some things that we're sharing with our clients. These are conversations we're having every day. Um, and it sounds like the majority of you are already doing it, but you need to make that transition into the future planning mode. Um, there should be an adjustment of resources. I'll share with you an example um, that you can probably draw reference to is, is we work with, um, with a high-end um, meat delivery and butcher shop out in uh, Utah. And their business was a brick and mortar where people would come in and restaurants would order their stuff and go pick up their food and then, and then leave. 
Well, because of this, that changed. Um, so we adjusted this to an online system. And what we did for them is we helped enhance their digital footprint, both on social media and their website. And we went ahead and created a digital marketing membership. Uh, for them, it was a, a, um, a delivery of the month. And every month they get a certain number of different products for a certain fee. Um, and it actually, people loved it. Um, quite frankly, probably because everybody was stuck in their house and they're ready to have some good food and, and perhaps some libations to match that. But year over year, um, we're actually up 200% for that particular customer in revenue, which is sort of mind boggling because before they didn't really do online orders. It was just walk in um, and phone. And now it's quite the opposite. So um, another example of that actually is laying that plan out. Uh, we work with a, a different customer um, that does high-end furniture sales, and they have eight brick-and-mortar stores around the largest markets in the country. And they came to us in March uh, kind of freaking out, right, because they're saying, look, our selling season is March through July, and 80% of our sales comes in from our retail stores, and they're all shut down. What are we going to do? They used to host very large grand openings. They would have cocktail parties. They would attend trade shows. All that was out the door. So what we did is we just adjusted and, and, and re sort of executed and dispersed those funds into online advertising and marketing. What we found through the search trends is people uh, were doing a large uptick of buying furniture in the store because they're sitting in their houses all day and they're getting sick of their patio furniture uh, and they wanted an outdoor living environment. So the timing of this was happening. Um, we actually had our, our recap call yesterday with them and uh, we're above projections for them. Uh, so very excited to say. So they did a, a focus on social media. They did a focus on letting their customers know that this is their new buying pattern. So I would share with you the same recommendation. Um, have conversations with your existing clients. Over communicate with your prospects. Work with your vendors and your referral partners to share with them what that new sort of option is for you. So let's go to this next poll question. You guys can go ahead and fill this out now. How has your customer buying experience changed? Um, think about it if you're offering a product or a service, commercial real estate, residential developers, attorneys, whatever, financial planning, whatever you're in, how has your customer experience changed for your customer? All right, let's see what the poll is for that. Somewhat the sales cycle has changed predominantly. Um, a little bit business as usual, congratulations to you. Um, either you're very lucky or you were prepared for something like this. Um, and in configuring you know, what the future looks like, um, that's happening now as well. So let's, um, let's think about this real quickly as we kind of go through this. And there is a new changing market in the landscape. Um, it, is in, it is creating opportunities for people. Um, and you need to sort of embrace that. You know, this virtual work from home thing is, is adjusting for a lot of people. So I would encourage you to look through the lens of the customer. Um, how has their buying habit adjusted? Um, was it a walk-in facility? Did you do in-person meetings? Those things are now adjusted. Um, try and think about it as an experience. And we work with all sorts of different customers, but we're trying to make that experience from initial contact to purchase or contract sign and make that as seamless as possible. Um, a quick example of that is we work with a large building supply company that contractors would go to their store and order parts, uh, pay for them, have a cup of coffee, and leave. They have 200 locations all across the country. Um, that's no longer an option. So what we had to think about and adjust for them is, is through the lifeblood of their business, which is inbound revenue, and we created an online order system. Um, we have an app that we utilize that for. Uh, we made it efficient and easy for the customer to buy that. And we created what's called curbside express pickup. So all of our customers get what they want. They get it fast, easy. Um, we created a touchless pay system for them. And then we needed to also build directional floor signs for once the next phase opens, they do get into that facility. What does that experience look like? So here's a couple of takeaways uh, in kind of closing out. These are action items. Um, you know, we kind of joked internally is in February and January, all the customers we talked to said, look, I got more business than I know what to do with. I really wish I could actually work on my business instead of for my business. And I would tell you right now is the time to work on your business. Um, we're seeing uh, kind of this, this gra you know, gracious sort of acceptance of everything we've been trying to get people to do for the last however many months or years. 
they're finally seeing that that it is important. So I, I would encourage you now to update your CRM system. Um, use LinkedIn as it's kind of this new virtual water cooler right now. It's seen an explosion of, uh, of communication uh, as well as social media. Um, but here's a quick easy tip. Um, whatever industry you're in, you want to try and be the thought leader of your industry. Um, pick 10 topics and do one a, one a month, you know. Um, you can use something very simple. This is a free, easy third party called MailChimp. You can set it up digitally. Um, the same with social media, build your content calendar in advance. I mean, there's nothing worse than our clients saying, I just don't know what to do for social media. And you try and wake up every day and think of that. Um, we do all this a month in advance. Um, you know, there's 20 business days in a month. Um, maybe just do 10 posts. Uh, you don't have to do it um, too, too often, maybe five posts. Just start easy and start planning this out in, in advance. And then of course now is, is the time that I would try and recommend that everybody pay attention to their search engine optimization scores and Google. Um, and that's something that any vendor uh, that can help you with. But um, you know, kind of in, in closing summary, we're, we're seeing a lot in this digital landscape that's helping businesses uh, thrive. Um, for those that are sort of staying stagnant and waiting to see what happens, um, you know, I'm not so sure they're going to be ahead of this curve. So we're seeing things happen. The first or two months were a little bit scary, but right now things are happening very fast and it's exciting to see what Matt's seeing on the government side. So with that, Jim, I'll kick it back to you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, great job. And it's nice to see how you've been able to manage through this with some of your customers pivoting and figuring out ways to really surprise them. I would imagine I can't, I can't even think that someone would think they would grow quickly uh, coming out of a time like this when they got to shift gears, change plans, change the way they operate. So uh, really good stuff. And, and hopefully that resonates with the folks that are attending today. Thanks again for being here. Um, let's move on to Gwen Griggs. Gwen has been a chief counsel in the past and has actually started her own firm here in Jacksonville about, I think about five years ago, Advos Legal. And she's involved in all kinds of different things on the legal side, transactions, regular corporate stuff, et cetera. Um, sorry to use the scientific word like stuff. Um, but uh, we're thrilled to have Gwen here today to listen to what she's got to say. So Gwen, thank you. I will turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. Um, and thank you to the panelists. I think the theme I'm hearing, and, I, and it's certainly true for me, is um, where we were four months ago feels like four years ago, right? As, um, as Mike ran through all the things he was doing, people are cramming what they might have, what might have taken them years to do um, into just a few months um, and really speaks to the resiliency of, of the American business. Um, sort of, Jim and I were chatting a bit about, you know, how what, what we do can add value to our local community. Really, that's, that's um, the purpose for being on the panel today is what what do we do that that could add value and in that conversation we said let's let's try to what are, what are the things that i am talking about all day long every single day um and really condense that into the next 10 minutes or so um and as we as i looked through almost all my conversations are folks around a handful of different things that seem very disjointed um they they're um they don't seem to flow, they don't seem to necessarily connect, but the tie is, and it's really how we work with our clients as well. So um, you're faced with something right in front of you, but don't ever forget that there's a really, there's a bigger picture here. And the way that we react and the way that we handle this, um, this crisis time is, is gonna have an impact on our business today and, um, if we ever decide we're gonna sell those businesses, how we responded will matter to a potential buyer or investor. And it matters to our employees, right? So we have an opportunity to um, show who we are, um, be part of our character, um, explore our values. So just like this, there's, there's some trees here, there's some tiny buildings, but there's a road. You don't really know what's past the road. What we're trying to get to though is the, is the bigger picture. So what is that bigger picture? So I'm gonna get into the weeds, but know that, that the theme for all of it is, is making sure we're taking the long view. So really I wanna say probably 90% of the conversations that I've had in the last three months have focused on three things. Um, going back to the office, 
um, business relief programs, and then sort of M&A and finance. And that going back to the office has, has evolved a lot in the last, right? Three months ago, it was how do we leave the office because we're, we're being um, required to work from home or required to look for some other opportunities. So even that in the last three months is, has been an evolution of conversations. So I'm going to start with this first poll question, um, just to get a sense of, from the group here, when are you going back to the office? You, you know, can't keep me away, depends on the day, never going back, or you know, that wasn't an option for me. I, I just had to keep working. Let's see what the response looks like. So it depends on the day. And I think that's, that's certainly what we're hearing from, from our clients and, and our circle as well is for the most part that um, people, are, people are getting back, but not necessarily getting back in the same way that they were pre-COVID or back in February. Um, and you know, I think it's interesting that the number two response here, never going back, I think there's a lot of people who've discovered that um, they can be efficient, they can um, accomplish the work that they need to accomplish without having to um, be at the office. So I think you'll, we're going to see some trends come, come from that. Let's see, there we go. So let's get back to the office. Um, you know, like I mentioned, first we had, to, we had a lot of conversations about how to work from home and how to work remotely. Um, And now we're having conversations about how to get back to work or get back to the office. Um, what we're finding, and I think, it, I think I've heard it a bit on this panel too, is everyone's perspective is so colored by their, their perspective and what, um, you know, what they're hearing from their circle, what they're hearing from their clients, geography. And you know, I know sitting here in North Florida and then having conversations with people who don't, who aren't from this region, aren't living in this region, that we, um, we're, we're pretty fortunate that you know, some of the, the most severe impacts um, generally haven't, haven't hit our region. Um, I'll also say that our clients tend to be healthcare and tech companies, and that is a region, and, and some of the data proves this out. So we've got the anecdotal data, but the, the broader perspective data proves it out that those industries have not seen the impact that you know, the restaurant or the entertainment industry may be experiencing. And so, or B2C or B2B to C, business to business to consumer, all of those are seeing, you know, pretty significant impacts and have to think about, think about it differently. Um, so in that journey of how to get back, um, looking at who your employees are and looking at, I think we talked a moment ago about from the customer's perspective, but in this case, you know, think about it from the from the employee's perspective. Are they? Um, is your business a business that requires exposure to the public, right? Or is it something that everyone is sitting at the office and doing their work? Because you're going to end up with wildly different analysis depending on um, that employee experience. Um, are there limitations on occupancy? Um, OSHA has some really great data um, and great guidelines. So looking at sanitation requirements, social distancing requirements. Um, um, so those are the perspectives that you'll want to look through about getting back to the office. So the second thing that we've spent a tremendous amount of time talking about are financial relief programs. And I, I heard a little talk about this on the panel already as well. But um, PPP, is, you know, did you take it and keep it? Did you um, take it and give it back? Did you, are you looking at the I, IDLE grant? This is also check all that apply. So, um, so the total is going to end up more than 100. Um, but curious how this matches with, with what we're hearing. So, yes, yeah, so it looks like everyone took the PPP money and it doesn't look like anyone gave it back. We had one client who gave it back, but for the most part, um, our clients all took um, the PPP funding. 
and a, a lot of them had the grant and the loan. And then in this case, some had the BISTAR COJ um, um, grants and funding as well. And I, frankly, I thought I was going to whiz through this section of the um, program because most people have already gotten their PPP. The, the legislation was getting more settled. SBA guidelines were getting more settled. And last week, um, obviously, some new legislation was signed into law that ex that, that fixes really some of the problems that people were having with the PPP. Uh, since everyone has it, everyone knows that it was... It, um, the amount was determined by two and a half months of payroll. The forgiveness was eight weeks. That has now been extended to 24 weeks. Um, as everyone was figuring out the calculations for 75% um, had to be payroll, that, that has also changed to 60%. Some of the changes in um, workforce amnesty. So if you don't have the same number of employees this, as you did in February under the original law, it would have been um, penalized for that. There's a couple different ways now that you can, you can get around that. Um, so a lot to, a lot to digest there. The, um, the idle, you know, a lot of our clients are looking at that too, 3.75% interest rate over a 30 year term. So that's, um, that's pretty attractive as well. But I, I really would like to talk a bit about what's next. So this poll, right, what, so what's, what's the mindset right now? You're, are you a business that's ready to sell? You've got, you see opportunities out there, or you really aren't, 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 aren't through the clouds yet and looking, waiting to look to 2021. So let's see what our, what our attendees, what they're thinking. So overwhelming number, or not overwhelming number, but the, but the majority um, is, aren't, aren't thinking of either of these things right now. They're, they're really saying, let's, let's see what happens in 2021. Um, second most popular is, you know, at least a, a, a good segment, 29% are ready to look at opportunities to sell, and, and some are starting to look for opportunities to, to buy a company. So this is um, this sort of talking a little bit about the state of the capital markets. Um, 2019 was a record setting year for American um, private equity fundraising. The um, 2019, the industry raised $919 billion, which was similar to 2018, you know, 14% growth year over year since 2014. So, you know, I've got a picture of a race car here because um, the industry was just racing. It was, it was, you know, pedal to the floor, going as fast as it could, looking for opportunities, um, and then sort of grinding halt, which, you know, break, brakes um, slammed and dust flying. So what I'm hearing is year over year, we were, the M&A industry is about, is down about 50%. Um, PitchBook does a lot of research and they have released their first quarter data and um, M&A activity was down 25.1% Q1 over um, Q1 2019. It's a little misleading though, because if you, if you recall, you know, January, February, COVID wasn't impacting anything. So we're really only talking about the impact in the last few weeks of March and it still had a 20, 25.1% um, impact. So, it would be interesting to see what happens Q2. Anecdotally, and I'll, and I'll share some of our, some of the experiences we've had, which seem very much in line with what I'm hearing from colleagues in the industry. Um, we had three deals that were under LOI beginning of March when, when the world shut down. And all three of them went on pause or delayed or, you know, stop, start. Um, one of them ultimately has come back and closed last week. The other two are both back on. So, and I think that, even though that's anecdotal, I think that's what we're hearing across the board is if you had an LOI in place pre-March 10th, then probably the deal was paused for some period of time, but, but likely came back um, or is talking about coming back. And it, 
it's also very um, industry specific. So those are all healthcare slash healthcare tech companies. Um, in some instances where it's a B2B or, um, I'm sorry, B2C or business to business to consumer, um, we're seeing a lot more impact on those deals in terms of valuation. Um, and you know, sort of the next question is where do we go from here? And what we're starting to see is that people are, and, I, and again, I, I, I caveat that with, we are in a marketplace where we weren't as impacted as a lot of other markets were. And so the sentiment in this community seems to be, we're ready to get back to work. We're ready to start finding opportunities. You know, we talked about capital that had been raised. Those companies um, or those private equity firms need to put that capital to, to work. And so that's their mandate, that's their requirement, and they're gonna make that happen. Um, so we're starting to see some new LOIs, we're starting to see some activity. One of my colleagues um, shared a story that never in their industry, never in their history, had they ever um, signed an LOI without meeting the management team. But for the first time ever, they had signed an LOI without meeting the management team. So I, I think the world is adjusting and, and the capital markets are adjusting to um, a, a new normal. Um, So I, that, I think that covers the high points of what I was um, trying to communicate and hope that's really helpful and adds value. And Jim, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Gwen. Uh, you know, I love that everybody had some anecdotal items in their piece today. Uh, I think uh, for, for all of us out here working in, in business owners or whatever piece, uh, or whatever role you play in your organization, uh, it's nice to hear what's happened in real time, some success, some success stories, some things that aren't working. Um, so, uh, you know, I would share with you as well that we have seen very similar types of things that we've heard today. Uh, we have uh, uh, M&A piece as well, uh, playing in some of the same sandboxes as Gwen, and we definitely had this shutdown deal, and then everybody started picking their pencils back up recently. I do feel very lucky and thankful that we're in this region because you can talk, when we talk to folks around the country, uh, it's slow moving in some places. So we're pretty fortunate down here that uh, we're moving, I think, a little bit faster, maybe around turn two or three, where other folks are still coming around turn one. But um, thank you, Gwen, that was excellent. So um, we've gotten to the Q&A part of the program. Uh, so. I've got uh, some questions that have loaded up here in our Q&A bucket, and I'm gonna start with those. If you have any questions uh, out there that you're thinking of, or maybe you didn't wanna ask before or whatever, don't be bashful, send them in. We've got a good uh, bucket here. We are going to try to keep this at one hour today and let everybody get back to work at the top of the hour. We're going to really try to hold to that this time. We've gone over the last two times, but I think we've made way today for enough time to get through our Q&A. So the first question here is face-to-face -face meetings and a hands-on approach are critical to the foundation of our business of success. How can we pivot to an online e-commerce business model selling professional services when Zoom meetings aren't cutting it? You know what, I would, uh, I'll give that one to Mike. Sure, thanks Jim. Um, well, obviously you need to get a little bit of better understanding of the particular services, but we do have a customer that had a similar scenario in the B2B world. Um, what they were doing is, is they had lots of in-person meetings, and so they created these educational learning walkthroughs. So essentially, think about your sales presentation of your B2B services that you do. You have to try and have an interactive experience with them. Um, sounds like Zoom perhaps isn't cutting it. Um, but on the surface, what I would do is, is I would try and create an animation or some sort of video talking about your service, what you do, why you do it, why you're better than your customers, and have that available either in a format where you and your salespeople can send to that prospective customer, or more importantly, use it on your website, uh, your social media, um, as well as an e-newsletter, and use it as an educational walkthrough because if you can't go and read that body language and shake that hand anymore, um, you need to do everything you can to try and get at least three quarters of what that presentation is um, somehow captured and being able to send that 
And I would use that as, as perhaps like a lead list to try and get that in-person Zoom call afterwards. So it's more general in nature. Yeah, I like that, Mike. And I think, uh, I think the Zoom thing is still new. So I, just to follow on what Mike said, I, I wouldn't quit on Zoom yet. Uh, maybe look inward a little about how to, you know, I think Mike said, animate the thing somehow. Um, people are still getting used to it. Uh, there are people that, you, that were using it prior and they're very good at it, they're used to it great, but there's still plenty of people that are not used to it. So don't quit on it yet. I would still try to find ways and add in the things that Mike mentioned. Okay, next one. My revenue went to almost nothing during this COVID period. As it begins to come back, what type of things should I be doing to position myself for an exit? What other things would buyers be interested in when looking to find an opportunity in a hard hit industry? And how do I protect myself from getting taken advantage of? Okay, well, that's, that's uh, 32 questions in one. Uh, I think I will give that to Gwen. Gwen, you could try to tackle that animal and maybe I'll help you if, if, if yeah, you need. No, that, that might be a two person job for sure. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because what we're also hearing is that while business is starting to come back for the, for the investment community, deals probably won't close until fourth quarter, first quarter. Um, so, so really, if there's something to be done right now, it is positioning yourself well so that when you want to pick that conversation back up, you have done all that you can um, to make your, to present the company well. I don't know enough about the industry to know if it went to zero. Obviously, I'm assuming it's not going to stay at zero. So being able to explain what you did, how you did, how you led, how you led, how you look for innovation, um, those are going to be key things that a buyer would be interested in knowing about. Um, and where you see opportunity. Um, you know, if it went to zero, what are you doing to get it back? And, and how can you pivot? You know, Mike talked a lot about companies that could have gone to zero and found a way around. I think of entrepreneurs, right? You throw a big obstacle, big boulder in their way and they're like water. They're gonna find a way around it. And how quickly did you do it? Um, and then being able to prove that with some financials. So looking at the opportunities, um, but not knowing enough about the industry of, you know, who you want to talk to, those are, those are top of mind and getting some good advisors, um, you know, to help you think through that would be powerful as well. Yeah. I think that, that the last part of your question, uh, was how do you protect yourself from getting taken advantage of? I think that's exactly it. Going, making sure that you've got, some good advisors around you to protect you. Uh, try not to go sell the thing by yourself. If you've done a bunch of deals before, then maybe you can manage it with your leadership team, et cetera. But for the most part, things are a little funky. Hey, we're in a different time. Uh, some, some of the buyers and some of the uh, large companies that we talk to every day uh, have a completely different perspective than some of the other ones. Um, some are focused more inward and some are taking advantage of the opportunity because they don't need to focus as much inward. So. It's, it's really, it's a varied mix where before I would say, everybody was kind of speaking the same language. Now I would say there's probably three different languages out there. So uh, great question. Okay, bear with me here. Next one. Uh, we've pivoted and our customer base did not respond positively. Should we stay the course and hope the churn levels out or revert back to pre-COVID and hope customers come back? Mike, I'm gonna give that one to you. Okay. Yeah, sure. So um, obviously you need to perhaps learn a little bit more about it. But what I would tell you is that we're, we're, in, we're in a living, breathing ecosystem right now. It's changing every day. Uh, so the fact that you've made an adjustment and perhaps it did not work the way you intended, I think is okay. So it's time for some adjustments. Um, what I would encourage you to do is if you've got customers that you, you know, have a particular relationship with, even a prospective customer that maybe doesn't do business with, I would try and connect with them directly and create your own type of focus group, if you will, and find out, you know, based on the service offerings of the products you sell, what is it that they enjoy? What is it that they don't like about the new procedure and how might it get better for them? Again, this, this kind of almost plays perfectly with that discussion we talked about earlier is think about your sales cycle through the, through the lens of the customer. And, I would encourage you to reach out to as many customers and prospective people that you work with as you can and find out what that feedback is and then pivot and adjust to that. 
Good. I like it. Thank you, Mike. Um, I've got another one here. You guys can keep these coming. Uh, what is the liability of using the PPP money over the longer term that was just approved? Do I run any higher risk of getting, not getting it forgiven? And what if they change the rules again? So, Gwen, I think that's a good one for you. Sorry, Matt. We'll, we'll, we'll try to slide you one here. I hope you don't fall. <laughs> I have questions for Matt if no one else does. But um, so, so I'll take them a little bit in reverse order about changing the rules again. So the original um, legislation was passed the end of March. This um, revision to it, the Flexibility Act, was passed last week. And, and it ad addressed issues that um, all the legislators, all the, everyone who was looking at it, really saw as an issue. I, I would not expect that we will have big fundamental shifts in new legislation affecting PPP, just because it, it, it was, it took a lot of um, political capital to get this passed. What we will still see, and if, if you've been paying attention, every couple of days, the SBA comes out with new guideline, guidelines, new guidance, um, Treasury is coming out with new guidance that are tweaking and adjusting. Um, but I think structurally, fundamentally big picture, it, it's, um, it's pretty well, uh, a lot of the elements are nailed down. Um, I, I, the question of whether it gets forgiven or not forgiven is, you know, as I just mentioned a minute ago, it's eight weeks versus 24 weeks. Um, there's, no, there's no change there because of the more recent legislation. It's, it's, just a, it's just a different Excel spreadsheet that you'll use to determine how much it is or, and when you want to apply. Um, so it, that becomes really very fact, spe spe fact specific and, and business spe specific. How much are you spending on, spending on payroll? How much are you spending on rent, utilities? Um, but you know, if you do that calculation, and the other part, I guess the other thing to mention is all along the way, they've said if you, whatever decision you make at any particular time, you're sort of grandfathered into whatever the regulations were at the time that that was, so everyone has recognized that the regulations have continued to change and the guidance has changed, you can rely on the guidance that you got at that particular time. One thing we are telling our clients to do though, and, and I would suggest to the attendees, um, is to document like real time at the moment. Um, we do them in typically as unanimous written consents of the board, but even if you're just a management team writing, you know, we, we applied for PPP because here were the things that had happened. The, this client, you know, left and our revenue was down, collections were a problem, whatever the facts are, um, so that when you're going through the forgiveness process, you've got some documentation that says that the, at that moment in time, here's, here's why I did it. And then, you know, we, all, we don't know what the future holds, so you, you, you don't have a revisionist history to, to contend with. Okay. Thank you, Gwen. Bear with me here when I get down to the next one. Uh, Can I ask Matt a question? Sure. Yeah. So this um, COJ money and the Buy Star money, and um, I guess it ran out pretty quickly. Like, curious to hear from the chamber's perspective or your perspective. What's next? What should businesses be doing there? Um, well, thanks, Gwen. Um, yeah, I did see yesterday that they did. Um, they opened up the one element of the assistance and it was it had kind of run out in about five hours and so that's what you know i know our um city council the mayor's office are, are looking at everything that they can do to kind of you know help reinvigorate things and i think that's it'll be interesting to see because a lot of that money um came from the cares act there was about 165 million give or take that came uh, to the city to to handle um issues like this with small business owners and there was the some rent assistance and some other things. And so that's, I, I think it's still an evolving process. Um, as they're, you know, at, they worked very quickly to get to get the money out as quick as they could, which is kind of what the, the federal government did too. It, it's interesting in talking with some of our contacts in Washington, you know, when, cause our members have been frustrated about some of the changing rules with the PPP and some other things. And they said, listen, you know, you have to understand this, 
process is completely backwards from the way it's normally done. Usually you get all the rules and you get everything done and then you roll it out. This was, how do we get $3 trillion out tomorrow? And then we'll worry about the regulations later. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now is they're, they're having to go back and write the rules that they normally would have written and thought about for a year. And now they just got the money out and now they're trying to kind of figure it out. So that's, they've, you know, kind of been urging us to stress patience and things like that to just try and make sure that, you know, hopefully nobody, the regulations will work out in the end, in the, hopefully in the long term. But that's kind of why we're seeing so many changes that we wouldn't normally see, it's just because of the undone certain time. Good question, Gwen. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I've got a couple more here. We'll, we'll get you guys out of here at the top of the hour, as promised. Uh, at what point should we feel comfortable to start hiring again or bringing back our people? Um, Gwen, you can take that one. All right. Um, there are two different questions there, right? Hiring again, I think, is a function of um, predicting revenue and predicting business growth and what are your, what are your needs. Um, and so that, to me, is a, a bit of a financial, uh, you know, evaluation. So you, you look at, is this the time, you know, there's a lot of conversation about the talent that's on the sidelines right now. You know, uh, you know, people at all levels of companies have been let go for all sorts of different reasons. And, and so maybe there's an opportunity to snag some people that might have been hard to get six months ago or a year ago. So I think companies are, are doing that calculus to see if that's, a, that's an appropriate um, decision to make. The bringing people back, and I'll jump back to what I was saying before, like Mike was saying, the customer journey, it's a little bit about the employee journey. And, you know, for your business, do you need face-to-face? -face? Do you, is it B2C? Um, and then, and we're seeing a lot of companies, law firms, and, and a lot of our clients have started phasing in June 1st, and then June 15th seems to be another day that a lot of companies are looking to alternate days that they come back or, um, you know, and, and listen, that, you know, making sure that your, your team has, feels free to let you know what, what they're concerned about and being honest. And then obviously you've got some work to do to think, how is that going to work with your business objectives? Very good. Um, and Jim, if, if you don't mind, Matt can jump in there real quick. I know that, you know, from our members perspective, a lot of them, are starting to bring their folks back. Just, um, you know, I, as, as you guys are, I'm sure, I mean, I think we're, we're on Zoom calls at least half of our days. And, and I'm noticing that a lot more of our folks are um, in their office instead of in their um, den or, you know, back patio or wherever they happen to be doing a lot of their work. So I know that um, part of what the business, the mayor's business advisory task force did was give some guidelines on reopening and, you know, distancing and things like that. I know a lot of our, our members are asking us about that, you know, masks and sort of what we're doing in, in terms of um, distancing for meetings and things like that. So we, it is a conversation where I, I do think that you're starting to see a lot more people. They're starting to bring folks back in. Good. That's good to hear. Uh, I've got one left here. Um, and this came in actually before your piece, Mike, but I, and you may have touched on it a little bit, but you, you could probably round it out here and then I'll close this out for everybody. With more people working from home and online, uh, with more people working from home and online, do business, businesses need to put more emphasis into their social media presence? Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I mean, like I mentioned a little bit earlier in the piece, is you probably need to be focusing on your social media. What does your website look like? Um, are you mobile friendly? Um, search engine optimization is so key right now. You know, I, I, meant, I briefly mentioned, you know, a couple examples of people that really did not generate revenue from online. There, there wasn't an e-com model um, and they had to quickly do it. And what it's actually done is, is it's kept their numbers up in some cases and, and kept them flat and some they're much, much better off and more profitable. So what that means for them is they can actually um, process orders or, you know, consulting fee, you know, they can do more of that online uh, and it's more efficient. And then if you had a brick and mortar, you know, maybe there's a model in the future where you don't need that rent. You don't need to pay people there. 
So I think it's just an adjustment that's happening. Um, I would also encourage you to pay particular attention to, you know, mobile friendly. Um, you know, what we're doing and from the website standpoint is all websites that we're building and this started in January this year because of Google's recommendation is everything is being built first with mobile in mind and secondary from a desktop view. So the reason that is is because we're, we're reaching percentages of 80% of all traffic is happening on your phone uh, and it's got to be fast and easy. For an example, think about ordering food online. If it's easy on your phone and it's fast, you're going to do it. If it's not, you're going to get frustrated and go to the next restaurant. The same process and, you know, psychological um, acceptance works in all areas of business. Great. Thank you, Mike. And, and thank you to our speakers, guys, for being here today. There's a lot of work that goes into this. I really want to thank them. But also, uh, really want to thank all of you for attending today. We want to be a continued resource for you. We have an email set up, uh, navigateqa at gmail.com. You can send anything you want after the fact. Uh, we also post the webinars for you so you can see them afterwards. Or you can share them if you'd like. Uh, reach out to me if you'd like to be involved. You certainly can find the other folks, our great panelists today on LinkedIn and other spots. Uh, and I'll leave you with this. Please stay positive and thankful and focused and thoughtful. We are going to come out better. We are making progress. Stay tuned for part four coming soon to a theater near you. Uh, that's all for today. I hope you guys have a great afternoon. And uh, that's it from here. Peace. Thank you.